Good morning, respected director, Reverend Father Crispino D'Souza, principal, Ms. Mina Saldana, Reverend Father Orwell Cotino, coordinators of the various sections, heads of departments, teachers, and my dear students. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life for me, and I'm feeling good. These are the lyrics of Michael Bublé's famous song titled Feeling Good. Today, we are indeed feeling good as we take on yet another exciting event at DBIS. For the first time ever, Don Bosco International School will be hosting a one-of-its-kind student-led panel discussion. We believe that breakthrough innovations occur when we bring down boundaries and encourage disciplines to learn from each other. The science department and the English department have done exactly that. We have broken down boundaries and have approached this panel discussion with an interdisciplinary approach. This panel discussion is a combined and collaborative effort of the science and the English department. Our topic of discussion today is a question, a trending question that many are seeking answers to. Is data the new oil? Data has become an extremely important resource in today's times. But is our data being used effectively? Or is our data being used for destructive purposes? What are various multinational companies doing with our data? Is our privacy at stake? Through our panel discussion today, many more questions like these will be answered. Our panelists, who are students from grades 6 to 9, along with the moderators, are ready to begin. Are you? So let the discussion begin. For the first time at DBIS, we will be presenting a student-led panel discussion. Our panelists are young, very young, students from grade 6 to 9. When we envision a panel discussion, it's always a panel of experts in their special fields. Today, however, we have a very young lot of panelists who have researched thoroughly, or as thoroughly as they could, to develop an, as close an expertise as they could master. Namaskar. Good day, buen dia, bonjour to all present here. Let us begin with a prayer, the world's greatest virus connection. I invite Durga to say the prayer. And now with the Almighty's blessings, let us begin our panel discussion by introducing the topic, Is Data the New Oil? I'm sure the topic has sent many antennas up as did mine when I first heard it. Each of the panelists have researched the topic from various perspectives, from the point of view of sports, environment, space, education, media, medicine, entrepreneurship and law enforcement. Hence, the research has helped them view their field in its entirety, making them young experts. Here are our young experts. From grade 6, please welcome Anushka Gangwani and Aruri Sodi. From grade 7, we have Sakshi Bhatikar and Sarthak Jadav. From grade 8, please welcome Mansa Varma and Siddhar. And from grade 9, we have Durga Nani Varekar and Vithan Bhattacharya. Each of the panelists will speak for three minutes from their perspective on the topic, followed by a question round to each of the panelists, while I, Kia Shah, and I, Akriti Mara, are the moderators for today's panel discussion. So, without further ado, let us dive into our topic of discussion. Is data the new oil? Let's begin with Don Bosco's favorite subject, sports. How data in the sports industry is used to their advantage. Let's hear our first panelist, Ari Sodi. 
Many industry experts have recently stated that data, not oil, is now the most valuable resource in the world. When properly cleaned up, data becomes information, allowing companies to make better decisions. But where does this data come from and how is it used? Did you know that 60% of the world uses the internet? That's around 4.7 billion people. And 50% of the world's population is on social media, myself included, following me on Instagram. From finding the newest gaming PC to searching for the world's meaning. Including the speech content has come off the internet. And this is exactly where the data comes from as well. Let us have a look at how the sports industry is working around data. Say for example, I am Nike and I am launching my latest range of the best exercise shoes on the market. How do I go about sourcing my customers and advertising them about my product? I will gather all the, da pe the data of people searching for exercise, shoes, health and fitness online. I may also include my target group people searching for how to lose weight, best workout apps, football training near me, most beautiful tracks, heights, etc. This way, I am able to have a comprehensive database of all my target customers in sports. I then target these customers with advertisements of my product, which pops up on their social media, hoping they buy my shoes. However, this is still the traditional way of online marketing. Brands are now innovating and constantly looking at ways to engage with their target group online. Influencer marketing is now something that has come up in a big way, where brands loop in with famous celebrities, personalities to promote their brand and their product on their personal social media accounts, thereby influencing their followers to make a purchase. Nike has signed a $1 billion contract with Cristiano Ronaldo and has a combined social media following. This contract ensures Nike has a ready database of potential customers. Even in the lockdown phase, sports brands are, have invented and implemented strategies to keep their followers engaged. Brands like Adidas and Reebok have innovated with workout from home videos using the help of the influencers to maintain engagement with their customers. Thank you. Thank you, Adivi, for that wonderful insight. Moving on, we have Mansa who will take us into the world of medicines and how data is being used there for its advancement. In the 21st century, data is now capable of being compared to oil in asset value. If tapped into and extracted from well, it's quite a commendable achievement. As we metamorphose into a digital economy, the significance of data is on the rise. While raw data doesn't possess much value, Defined data does. Gathering data and precisely connecting it to further collected data grants us the ability to utilize it in critical decision making. By introducing a more proactive and calculated approach to making key decisions. Data gives us more room for accurate scheming, which has proven to push the, bound, push the boundaries of its use in the medical field. Data tracking and analysis have been observed to change the environment for the better. The use of data in medicine is driven by the need to resolve both local organization problems such as the medical agency declining of workers and its growing income, along with humanity's global problems like predicting epidemics and fighting existing diseases efficiently. The collection of the collection of healthcare data helps health facilities produce far better holistic patient opinions, personalized procedures, advanced methods of treatment, enhanced communication between physicians and patients, and improve health outcomes. The advancement of telemedicine is something which should not be left out when talking about the application of data in the medical field. Telemedicine, the provision of remote clinical, clinical services, a world which withholds which withholds a primary diagnostic all primary diagnostics and consultations, as well as extensive health status monitoring of monitoring of the patient and even assistance in surgery. 
Telemedicine medicine is not a new in the medical field, but with the introduction of smartphones, wireless handheld devices, and video conferencing, it's unleashed its full potential. This is also an analysis which has been conducted by Harvard Medical School, comparing the accuracy of machine learning systems against human pathologists in breast cancer reduction. Detection. The results displayed a 99.5% increase in accuracy. This suggests that newly diagnosed cancer patients are now regularly observed and that genes are used to collect crucial data which can be utilized in conjuring the most optimal drug. In conclusion, the application of data in the medical field opens many doors to changing people's lives for the better. Implementing data into this field has strongly suggested that it's a decisive step towards saving lives and developing better preventive measures. As the quote says, prevention is better than cure. Thank you. That was such a refreshing perspective, Mansa. Thank you. Now we will dive into the field of education with Sakshi who will tell us about how data is being used to supplement learning. In the 18th and 19th century, oil was one of the most prized and scarce commodities in the world. Countries that had oil reserves like Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia became rich by selling petroleum products to other countries. Now in the 21st century, the rules of the game have changed. Data is the new oil of the digital economy. Companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook are the top companies and the most profitable in the world. These companies have a control over data, which is their weapon to success and profits. In today's time, no one can live away from the digital world. Recent reports suggest that in India, currently there are more than 500 million internet users. And this number of users is only second to China just 731 million internet users. Data is being increasingly used by companies as well as education institutes. In schools and colleges, data is much more than just exams and test scores. It creates a fuller picture of the student, the entire class, and the school's performance. When one combines many school performances, you can get the district or the state's performance records. Good data beats opinions and emotions. When students are stack ranked and compared on data points like test scores, presentation scores, practical activity scores, sports scores, it becomes easier to know the growth of every individual student. There's a new concept called Big Data Analytics. Big Data Analytics monitors every student's activity, like their favorite subject or how much time they take to solve a test, or extracurricular activities and many other components. There can also be a report published that can show the interest levels and interest areas of every single student. With data, students and teachers have the past and present information at their fingertips. I believe data is very important for the developing world and that it's the new oil in education. Wow, that is such an interesting perception about how data influences education. Next up, we have Bithan, who will talk about data and its effect on various industries from the viewpoint of an entrepreneur. If there ever was a commodity without which it is unimaginable to exist for present-day man, it is the valuable asset of oil. After drilling 69 feet underground, Edwin Drake gave way to one of the biggest, if not the biggest, industries in the world. Oil was the most valuable resource for various decades, but now tables have turned. Hence the new famous quote, data is the new oil. As an entrepreneur in the digital economy, I strongly believe that data is one of the most valuable possessions, where ma many firms are treating it as a corporate asset amongst the many enterprises around the world. As we know, oil powers various industries, such as the petroleum industry, the electric power industry, and many more. In a similar fashion, data powers many industries too. A type of data, known as big data, is used in the insurance industry, the telecom industry, and most importantly, the IT industry. In current times, the IT industry has flourished immensely, 
and is a world's leading industry. India has become the world capabilities hub with a huge chunk of the world's digital talent present in the country. Along with this, jobs have increased to an awe-inspiring 63% in the IT industry in India. And according to this, um, according to this, many experts feel that India will prevail in the digital era, making huge profits out of huge assets in the future, thus increasing their GDP by a vast factor. Enterprises have now developed, uh, started developing various products and services with data-driven analogies, especially ones in the IT industry. Hence, we can conclude from all this that data, like oil, is the part and is the foundation of various industries and will pave way to many in the future. It is the foundation of the IT industry, which is the world's leading industry. Unfortunately, with matter comes the antimatter. Oil may be used for explosives and data may be used for such destructive purposes too. There has been a huge increase in the value of assets in the digital economy, such as data. And with this huge increase in value, there would obviously be misuse, which is observed on the black market. Countless pieces of data are sold for extremely high prices, revealing some very personal information, putting many lives and enterprises in jeopardy. After this arises the major topic of corporate espionage. Recently, a popular app had skyrocketed to 32.3 million downloads until it was banned in July of 2020 in India. The main idea which the media had highlighted was the political disputes between the Indian and Chinese government and violent ones too at the borders. But the real problem lied beneath this. Corporate espionage is another way uh, various forms of data can be retrieved by individuals and even governments from such popular apps. This was the problem. This popular app was found to be storing one's contacts, IP address and even one's exact GPS location. Above all, from all this we can conclude that data is the oil of the digital economy. It is such an influential asset that it may be used as a weapon, inflicting serious damage, but it may be a boon at the same time, raising many opportunities. Thank you. Wonderfully spoken, Madan. We have Anushka who will be speaking about how data can help sustain and preserve the environment. Knowledge is power, and in this century, data is knowledge. Data analytics can be used in many ways for the preservation of the environment by helping various organizations become more sustainable. The solution is now right in front of us and it depends on us on how we optimize information. Data analytics for the conservation of endangered species. In an article from Past Company, it has been mentioned how data analytics is used in tracking down suppliers whose guns were being used by rhino poachers. They used the serial numbers of the guns which were left behind in parks and combined it with external resources such as social media posts and police data. Environmentalists were able to establish links between them all and make several arrests. This has facilitated a steady drop in the number of endangered rhinos killed. Another example is data analytics being used to help reduce energy consumption. There are organizations that can provide customers with data on how their electricity usage impacts CO2 emissions in the area. Data analytics, for example, can help detect malfunctioning water meters in real time, therefore helping them to be identified and fixed much faster. In this way, one can, in their individual communities, become more conscious about usage patterns, thereby helping the planet. It is 
through environmental monitoring that scientists slash researchers will be able to provide answers to problems related to deteriorating environmental conditions. This will in turn help in making informed decisions and analyze new insights baked by scientific data. Lastly, it helps to reduce supply chain environmental footprint. The process of producing an item from manufacturing to transporting has a higher carbon footprint than others. One particular tool allows businesses to enter data such as their source of suppliers and energy consumption, which will then crunch the numbers and generate an overreaching environmental footprint for the company. This can lead to a huge positive impact on the environment. To conclude, it entirely depends on the human race to use knowledge to do good after all the human race has in the past made treaties and use its intelligence to curb war and strength. What a delightful viewpoint on data and its effect on the environment. Now Sarthak will be telling us about space and how data will help us in further exploring it. With the increasing number of inhabitants, contamination, waste, temperature and decreasing number of species, trees, drinkable water, space is the only location left which can help humanity to escape out from the black hole of issues arising day by day. The future awaits when the earth will be uninhabitable and humanity will find no possible outcome to exist on the earth. Scientists around the world have been collecting data about space in order to plan a better future for humanity. NASA and UAESA spent billions of dollars and have launched orbiters and rovers to Mars to study the planet's atmosphere and any signs of life which enables an opportunity to create a suitable environment for humans. Mangalyaan tends to find dried and subglacial rivers on the Martian surface and important data about the upper atmosphere signifying dust storms having a height of hundreds of kilometers. In 2011, NASA sent Curiosity rover to Mars which had changed the global perspective of this planet as signs of unicellular microorganisms and active water bodies have been found beneath its surface. Which tells us that Mars, in its past years, had liquid water and had been habitable. With problems coming up day by day, governments all over the world have been ambitioning asteroid mining and space to help figure out the obstacles every country faces in the world, which is poverty and unemployment. These asteroids are worth trillions of dollars as they have one of the most precious and rarest of metals. But these machines are viable long-term missions as the technology and infrastructure to refine asteroids are yet to be developed. The economic implications of space exploration expand into new industries as there are huge opportunities for the mining, energy and space traveling industry. Space exploration has also helped us to find the approximate age of the universe, new dwarf planets in the solar system, Enceladus, one of Saturn's moon having an underground ocean, and many more just in the past two decades. All small bits of this data can be used to further study our universe. Also, the machines we use to gather the information often get advanced during space exploration. Some examples of these are wireless devices insulin pumps, solar cells, etc. From everyday life to missions costing billions of dollars, the data we collect is always more important than any other element not only present on the earth but also in the universe as it has the ability to change history. Thank you. That was so intriguing, Sartha. Thank you. So this is up next and he will tell us about how big data is affecting media and entertainment. The size of the oil market is around $2 trillion, while big data analytic businesses are also around $2 trillion. Oil and data, they both must be mined, they both must be refined before of any use. They both are of extremely, value, extremely high value, and both if not used responsibly, can result in catastrophic, harmful, and destructive damage. 
In case of oil, it has led to air pollution, sea pollution, and geopolitical conflicts. Whilst in case of data, it has led to political, social, and communal clashes. Answering the question, yes, data is the next oil. Just how oil powered the industrial revolution, data is powering our current, new, digital revolution. Data helps us address problems, find solutions, and drives productivity. And data plays a huge part in governance. Data plays a critical part in governance. For example, helping the government keep track of the COVID-19 cases and taking remedial action. But the question arises, how is data viewed from the media's perspective? The media and social media platforms collect your data with or without your consent in what they call social credits. Such information is used to compute what is deceptively called social credits. For example, if you follow people and entities that are considered a menace to a certain organization or an institution, you will get negative social credits. That can affect your chances of getting a visa, an immigration, a degree, land, and even acquittal. If you are a genuine threat to the country, then such negative social credits are justified. But on the other hand, such tools can be misused to scuttle free speech and freedom of citizens. In their eyes, you're no longer human. You're either male, female, white, colored, or simply just a statistic. You are constantly being profiled, which most of the time presumes you have no personality. Profiling leads to discrimination. For instance, data suggests that women tend to have lower paying jobs than men, but that doesn't suggest or make inferiority in women. At least, I don't think so. Political and social manipulation has become easier due to big data, that is dividing people for votes, creating disharmony, and manipulating the public opinion. Data is a double-edged sword. Whilst data has got all the attributes of being an enabler for humankind, it can be misused for destructive and harmful purposes. If mankind is to manage data the same way they managed oil, we need to buckle up for generations of conflicts, divides, and disputes. Thank you very much. That was so well encapsulated, Sid. Now, for our last panelist, we have Durga, who will elaborate on the topic for today from a law and regulation perspective. They say data is the new oil, but in many ways it is very different and much more problematic than oil or any other commodities that have emerged in the past. Big data creates not just wealth, but it also concentrates power in the hands of very few people. Big data is unique in the sense that it is not very transparent and there is very little knowledge about it among the public, government and lawmakers alike. History tells us that for some time new innovations and industries have a total free reign. They can do whatever they want until everyone else finds out what is actually going on. History teaches us that Laws only emerge once most of the damage is done and once everyone actually realizes the harmful consequences and the unintended dangers. It took over a century for us to realize how oil was harming our planet and it took a few more years to figure out how to make uh, emission laws and pollution laws. In fact, smoking was very popular once upon a time until people found out that it actually caused lung cancer and regulations were put in place. Now let's look at big data. So big data empires are very powerful. They are, can be even more powerful than governments themselves who make laws. This power comes not just from the data they collect and sell, but it also comes from their use of the data. They can use it to predict people's social and political behavior and their inclinations. This can make them, this can help them make very good predictions about what people will do and what people will not do. And this can make them predict what will happen in the future and maybe even control it. Users are purely merchandise and products that they sell and things that they control. They're never the beneficiaries. So all this is done in not just legitimate ways, but they also make blatant use of fake news, disinformation and other propaganda. This allows them to do many things with people's lives and it can also allow them to change them. 
the data empires have the ultimate ring of power and it is extremely naive to expect them to self regulate imagine you can control what happens to so many people do you think you will give it up also they are uh, they are bringing tremendous change into the world but let us remember that all this is merely profit driven suggesting that they should be regulated and laws should be implemented doesn't mean that you are going against progress it is actually benefiting progress progress doesn't only mean that we let all the innovations go unchecked it means that we make them and use them to the best intentions of all the people now the question arises who will bear this cap now the answer is not that simple the so by lobbying and funding political parties big data empires can easily put politicians and lawmakers in their pockets they are also in cahoots with defense establishments which allows them to suppress and stamp down whistle blowers like manning and snowden this allows them to stamp down whatever objections come up including valid ones this industry not just controls the media it is the media as most people consume the media through them this allows them to suppress conversations that go against the big data companies and they can easily make uh, awareness initiatives die down just because they don't want them to spread with these firms becoming the most valuable on wall street and more people investing money in them they become more dependent on big data companies making more profit and how do they make profit by surveillance capitalism collecting all your data so if there is a re- regulation passed that prevents this it risks facing the wrath of all those who will la- make less money when it's passed the most vicious form of data totalitarianism is what we see in china it is today literally a surveillance state with very limited free speech the country which is taking over the leadership in artificial intelligence and automation is also the one which makes the most malevolent use of big data this happened very easily in their society and it also happened very fast this tells us how we can go wrong and that this lies waiting in the path for us unless we implement regulation so in conclusion the data empire is unique it follows the exponential path of moore's law and can do many things in very short amount of time hence we do not have decades at our disposal to impose regulations there has been very little progress in the world to bring regulation in an exception being the gdpr passed by the eu this is considered a bandaid on an open wound but an open wound requires more than a bandaid and much more remains to be done Thank you, Durga, for such a captivating point of view. With this, we conclude the speeches. We now come to the end of our first round and move up to our question round. Our panelists will take a break to place their questions for the other panelists in a bowl. This question is for Anushka. Can you give me an example of any country that is successfully using data in the study of the environment? Sure. Copenhagen, a city in Denmark, has assimilated data related to CO2 emissions of its citizens. They use this data to come up with the Copenhagen 2025 climate plan. This plan aims at leveraging better quality of life. innovation and investment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2025 This question is for Sarthar Today there has been no evidence of life on Mars yet you say the data indicates the possibility what do you have to say to that Sarthar As I had mentioned the data collected by the curiosity rover NASA's latest Mars rover which detected burps of methane from specific locations but only at the end of Martian winter or the onset of spring and this is an ambiguous signal as inorganic geochemical processes would be seasonal and result in the release of methane but biological processes could cause this as well too hence the possibility of life on Mars Thank you.
SIP. TRPs are based on flawed data. In the drive to gain more TRPs, India media has left its ethics behind. What have you to say about this, SIP? The different TRP shows that people love conspiracies, controversies and fake news. Hence, it's no surprise that the media tries to make a conspiracy or a controversy out of almost nothing. The entire media and social media industry pivots around TRP. A media company or a TV channel that manipulates them not only get undeserved and ridiculous advertisement revenues, but more alarmingly, influence public opinion or build the fake mood of the nation. This question is for Durga. Durga, you said history teaches us that law and regulations for a new industry always occur after the damage has been done. Can you think of a solution in context of data? An immediate solution is introducing more transparency. Now by transparency, what do we mean? It means that, first of all, the users know where their data is going. They know what data is being collected and who has it in the first place. Second, they know where, who that, with whom that data is being shared and what they are doing with it. And three, they can dictate what the companies can do and cannot do with their data. It gives them ultimate control over what happens to their lives and what happens to their personal information. Secondly, we need to get rid of this widespread notion that just because we are getting free services, a free inbox, ability to chat with your friends all over the world, doesn't mean that gives the big data companies the right to take away the freedom over what data is ours. You can charge money if you want for communicating with friends across the world and that is certainly an amenity that all of us deserve to have. But we do not deserve to have our data taken from us without our permission. So this uh, misconception needs to be removed. Thirdly, we need to have more awareness among the young people in the world. So this, we need to make people know what is happening to their data and make people aware about what the big data companies are actually doing. Most people don't even know about this and naively put whatever information they want on their social media posts. So our school has taken some initiative in this and uh, last year we had a uh, session with Ms. Bharti Dekate about uh, data and privacy which was very helpful for everyone, parents, teachers and students. Now I don't know whether the, um, whether the older generations will be as open as students on this but I'm sure that young learners will be very keen on taking the initiative to spread this word and they are also open on making our world better and they are open to new ideas about how it works. So I think the key is to have awareness among young people about protecting data. That's how in the future a new regulation will come very soon. Thank you. This question is for Sakshi. Can educational big data provide a real-time alternative to assessment techniques and with bureaucratic policy making? Policy makers in the recent years have depended on large scale assessment data. Mostly they depend on large scale international comparative data. Educational data mining and analytics can provide a report on every student's progress and also you can know their growth. Uh, you can also give each student and appropriate learning content according to their level. So at an amount, this can also change the speed and the scale of educational change. The truth is that no matter how advanced your IT infrastructure is in enterprise or business, your data will not provide you with a ready-made solution. Vidhan, what are your views on this? I would say to help transform data into business decisions. You should start preparing your main points you want insights into. Based on the company's strategies, budget, goals and customer ta uh, target customers, um, one should prepare a set of questions which will walk one through smoothly to the online data analysis and arrive at relevant insights. Along with this, I strongly believe 
the process leading to a solution is more important than the solution itself. Mansa, you mentioned the advancement of telemedicine, but are telemedicine services reliable enough? What do you have to say to this? This question is often asked when talking about telemedicine. Yes, it's natural to question the reliability of telemedicine. Well, when choosing a reliable telemedicine system, here are a few questions we normally ask ourselves. Will my solution work on all smartphones, even low endpoints? Will it work for patients who have poorer connections, perhaps are living in remote areas or, or rural areas, or their older patients? Does it have infra an infrastructure of data centers to rely on, rather than using the general internet? Does it work even when changing between 3G, 4G, or even Wi-Fi networks? With telemedicine, we are often dealing with older patients or remote patients who might not have the best experience with technology or benefit. You're dealing with, or you're also dealing with younger people who expect things to work correctly the first time. Finding a solution that works clearly and reliably is crucial to any telemedicine success. This question is for Alia. The popularity of influencers has soared so much that as per a survey, nearly 93% of marketers use it now. Why? Thank you for your question. Here is my response. Firstly, the information provided by influencers is considered to be more truthful than brands. Secondly, influencers are viewed as third parties with no connection in promoting the brand. Hence, consumers believe what influencers have to say about brands more than what brands have to say about themselves. Thank you. We have now come to the end of this panel discussion. I would like to sincerely thank all the panelists for being here today and participating enthusiastically to make DPRC's first panel discussion a huge success. And finally, a huge thank you to Anita Ma'am for driving us and motivating us along with Priya Ma'am, Shannon Sir, Ms. Jessica, Ms. Reema, Ashton Sir, Aaron Sir, Ms. Janicia, Ms. Prajakta, Yorgin Sir, Odin Sir and Praveen Sir. This is I, Ahmati Malar and I, Kya Shah. Signing off. This panel discussion was an insightful experience and has allowed us to understand the topic of discussion from so many different perspectives. Let us hear what Father Crispino, Father Orville, and Meena Ma'am have to say. Okay, in the first place, uh, congratulations to the whole team that has put this panel discussion together. I know there are many people, many, many people uh, who have worked together the English department, the science department, the whole technical staff, the IT staff that has uh, you know, worked very hard to see that the whole panel discussion has gone on very smoothly and with a lot of clarity. That is one thing that sometimes causes a hitch in all our programs, you know, uh, this technicalities that come in the way. But I think today's panel discussion went on very smoothly. I must say a word of uh, kudos to all the panelists you know, uh, and the two hosts that we had. Uh, very well done, very well researched and threw a lot of light on this whole burning topic of uh, data and its usage. Uh, I'd just like to conclude with uh, a quote from the Bible, you know, uh, some days ago uh, at Mass, uh, we had the Gospel of Mark. So if you take the Bible and you take the book of Mark from the New Testament, you take chapter 7, verse 14, there is Jesus who is discussing with the Jews 
and the Jews accused Jesus of uh, uh, eating stuff or his disciples eating stuff that makes uh, them impure. Because as you know, the Jews were very traditional people. They had a lot of rules and laws. You know? uh, Durga was the one who spoke on laws. So, uh, and Jesus has something very beautiful to tell them. You know? And I'd like to quote him. And he says, what defiles a person is not what is outside. What defiles a person is what is inside. So when you look at data or any other commodity that we have, it is something that is external and it cannot be bad. What is bad is the way we as human beings use that data. So that is internal. So our thinking, our thought processes, you know, uh, the way we use data, that is what is crucial. So what humanity needs to do is to train human beings in the good use of data. And we have seen this right through history, whether it is the use of guns or the use of oil. And now the most important thing is data because data is knowledge and knowledge, if used wrongly, can be really, really very dangerous because here now you are talking about the privacy of the human being, you know. So when people invade your privacy, you know, that can be really very dangerous. And sometimes it is being done without your own knowledge. So what we really need to do, especially in schools, you know, and in all educational institutions, is to train our students on how to make good choices and to use whatever resource that is available outside you know, for the good of people and not for our own selfish needs. Thank you. Father Orwell. Uh, good morning. I've been very impressed and uh, I just wish to offer my congratulations to all of you. You have uh, gone drilled down, not only in search of oil, but even in search of facts and figures and gone beyond space too. And all around the world, you took us all in a journey and you brought us back here and fed us with so much of knowledge, of data, of, uh, of facts, of figures, of knowledge that I, I can stop reading for one week, only to assimilate and to digest what each one of you have said. And you did it so confidently. You had long speeches and big words, technical words, which you mastered and delivered with so much of confidence and grace. Thank you very much. God bless you and keep up the search and all the research as such and grow in knowledge and wisdom. And uh, we are small people, we are old people. I'm just looking at, uh, at a little picture that I saw yesterday, the grandfather talking to his son. And he said, uh, grandson, and telling him when I used to go to the supermarket or the markets in those days with five rupees, I used to buy bread, butter, cheese, uh, milk, so many things with five rupees. And the grandson is replying to him, but today, Grandpa, we cannot do that because uh, there are CC cameras watching over us. So <laughs> that's the beauty of your life. Thank you very much. God bless you. Good morning, uh, Father Crispino, teachers and students. Uh, I need to thank the English department and the science department for the collaborative effort in which we had our panel discussion. We also need to thank Nikhil, who first came in and guided our children about how a panel discussion takes place. Children, you all were brilliant. So proud of each one of you for the research you did on the topics that you were assigned. Congratulations to all of you. And yes, data is in. And it is, as Durga said, everything that's new and invented may not be good for us. And if you watch this documentary, The Social Dilemma, I'm sure you would have understood 
how harmful the, the same data can be in our own country we had a bill which was introduced in parliament about the protection of data how important it is and how it can invade your life so just like when the oil was discovered and yes the countries who had it became very rich and the people who used the oil misused it so much that now we are thinking of other resources so when we are looking at data i think as students and as adults we need to see that we use it wisely and yes our personal information should not be shared with the world which is what the data companies are doing and they are getting richer yes they are getting richer and they are providing us with employment and a lot of benefits but we need to think carefully and think what is good for us and what will be wiser for all of us thank you children for a lovely session this morning and congratulations to both our new prefects that is kaya and akriti for being the moderators and handling the whole session so beautifully congratulations to both of you thank you shannon for thank you so much the panel discussion thank you have a lovely day thank you father crispino thank you meena ma'am and thank you father oval on that note we come to an end of our event thank you for joining us for this one of a kind student led panel discussion we hope our young panelists were able to stimulate your thoughts and trigger some perspectives about these topics goodbye and have a nice day